Good evening. I'm Morgan Radford filling in for Joshua Johnson. Good to be with you this Wednesday, April 20th, and here is some of what we're talking about tonight. Russian forces are closing in on the Ukrainian port city of Mariupol. The troops commander says that his brigade may be facing their final hours alive. We'll introduce you to one man searching for his wife in eastern Ukraine who says he's certain that Russia is to blame. Plus, could Disney World lose some of its charm? How a bill might affect the theme park's relationship with the state of Florida. And Johnny Depp taking the stand today in a defamation case against his ex-wife. What he told the court about his fights with Amber Heard. And it's 420 and recreational marijuana is legal in New Jersey starting tomorrow. Later this hour, we take a deep dive into the weed industry all across America. We begin tonight in Mariupol, where Ukrainian forces are making a last stand. The port city has suffered from heavy shelling since the Russian invasion began, with people there surviving without food, water, and power for weeks, while thousands of civilians are feared dead. Now there's a focus on the Ovstal steel plant, where Ukrainian forces and civilians are both seeking shelter. But with each bunker bomb, the weight of the Russian onslaught is breaking down that resistance at the plant. The commander of the far-right Azov Battalion posting a plea for humanitarian evacuation. Mariupolsky garnizon, військовых, з нами більше ніж 500 поранених бійців та сотні цивільних осіб, серед яких є жінки та діти. Ми просимо надати нам безпеку на території третьої держави. corridor he's asking for, it's corroded. The Russian military could not ensure a ceasefire and Ukraine's deputy prime minister says it did not work as planned. Meanwhile, an advisor to Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky says they are still ready for special negotiations in Mariupol. This all coming the same day that a senior defense official tells NBC News that Ukraine's military now has 20 more fighter jets and bombers thanks to spare parts. On top of military aid, the U.S. is sanctioning more than 600 people tied to Russia, and President Zelensky says the European Union is now preparing a sixth package of sanctions. And just moments ago, G7 finance leaders say they have provided or pledged a total of $24 billion of aid to Ukraine thus far. Let's continue tonight with William Taylor, a former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine and vice president at the U.S. Institute of Peace. Mr. Taylor, it's a pleasure to have you with us this evening. First off, can we just do a general reset here? Can you tell us more about who this ASOF battalion is specifically? And just if you can, can you describe this last stand that they're taking? Because it's this type of far right unit that Russia points to as evidence that there are Nazis in Ukraine. Why is that? So, Morgan, the Azov Battalion um, uh, has a history um, of uh, being associated um, with far-right causes. Uh, they also have a history, Morgan, of fighting fiercely for Ukraine. So, th like a lot of things in that part of the world, this is, uh, this is a mixed picture. But on this issue, fighting there in Mariupol, we have to acknowledge the heroism of the Azov Battalion and the other parts of the Ukrainian military, um, including Marines that have been that have been fought, the fighting, and have rejoined uh, with the Azov Battalion. The Azov Battalion is also protecting civilians out there. So yes, uh, they have uh, they have a history, um, but they are they are heroes. Indeed, Morgan, Mariupol is a is is a hero city. Um, it has it has held out. Um, it has tied up forces from the Russian side uh, for weeks, indeed months, um, and that is helping the rest of the fight. So this is a this is this is quite a quite a feat for the Azov Battalion and the Ukrainian military more generally. Ambassador, you mentioned sort of this mixed picture, but but what is your hope and also your assessment of these humanitarian corridors specifically? This clearly should have been established before, earlier. Uh, the Ukrainians have been trying to establish these humanitarian corridors out of Mariupol and other cities, Morgan. I mean, it's not just Mariupol, but it's most dire um, in Mariupol. The, the situation is terrible and has been for some time. No electricity. We, we know this. No water, no food, no heat. Um, this has been terrible. And so the humanitarian corridors are so important. And the Russians have cynically bombed them when they tried to get out, when they tried to establish these corridors, 
the Russians would attack them. Um, so this is uh, th this is despicable, Morgan. Ambassador, the State Department levied more sanctions, and I feel like we always have this conversation about whether or not it's enough, but there always seems to be something or someone else to sanction. What is your take on that, on these sanctions as a tool? Sanctions as a tool to, to damage the Russian economy. Let's be clear. We're trying to constrain the Russian con economy from being able to afford to pay for the military, to pay for this un justified, unprovoked war. And, and these sanctions are reducing the capability, the, the Russian capability, to sustain this war. So this is, and needs to go one after another, layer after layer, volume after volume, uh, more people after more people, more, more uh, uh, companies, more sectors after more sectors. We have to damage this, right, it's sad to say, we have to damage the economy so that they can't Fight this war. And when you describe these sanctions, I mean, it almost d sounds like a tool towards the solution. But I, I want to ask you about a potential solution that one of our viewers asked about. And it was specifically about Ukraine ceding territory to end the war. And the viewer asked, would it, ceding territory, be enough to halt the war between Russia and Ukraine if the international community could come together to get them to release the land along the eastern border of Ukraine and western Russia to become an international zone for red world trade? That would include Donetsk, Mariupol, Crimea, to Odessa. What do you make of that suggestion, Ambassador? Morgan, the decisions about land, about terrain, about territorial integrity, um, those are decisions for Ukrainians to make. They're not decisions for Americans. They're not certainly not decisions for Russians. The Ukrainians will decide and have decided, they've indicated, that they're not willing to give up their territory. They're not willing to make concessions to Russia um, who invaded them without justification. There is no reason for us to push them to make any concessions. They are the ones to decide. They're the ones fighting. Morgan, they are fighting for us. The Ukrainians are on the front line of this fight with the Russians, and they're fighting on our behalf. We should support them both with all the weapons that we've talked about um, and with the sanctions that we just talked about, but we should also support them on their political decisions on how to prosecute this war and what to negotiate with the with the Russians or what not to. Ambassador, can I ask you to expound upon that? What do you mean when you say the Ukrainians are fighting for us? Absolutely. I'm glad you asked that question. So the Ukrainians um, are a sovereign nation, um, and they've been invaded by a big neighbor, more powerful, let's be clear, the Russians are clearly more powerful than the Ukrainians. Ukrainians, however, are, are fighting against the Russians so that the Russians don't move towards NATO. If the Russians are somehow able to win, I think they won't, Morgan, let's be clear, I think they won't, but if they were allowed to win, if we don't provide enough weapons, for example, to the Ukrainians, then the Russians will be on the border of NATO. Um, and we see over centuries, Nate, Morgan, over centuries, the Russians don't stop. They will then directly threaten NATO. They'll directly threaten Poland. They'll directly threaten the, the Baltic states. Um, and those nations, Morgan, are part of NATO, as we all know. And if they are threatened, then that threatens the United States. So, so the Ukrainians are holding out keeping the Russians from moving towards NATO. They are also defending their own land, and they're defending their sovereignty, and we should support them. Which it sounds like not just a last stand there in Mariupol, but a last stand more generally. Ambassador Taylor, thank you so much for your time and your expertise. We appreciate you joining thank, us. Thank you, Morgan. And to our viewers out there, please continue to send us your questions about what's happening in Ukraine. I mean, you are what makes this show so special. So please send along any questions you have, and we'll ask our experts some of those questions live right here on the show. You can find us at NBC Now tonight on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram. You can also leave us a voicemail, 888 to NBC, or you can email nowtonight at NBCnews.com. We look forward to hearing your questions. And stay with us because coming up, one man in Ukraine desperately searching for his wife, who was serving as an EMT. He'll share his deeply personal story right when we come back. Don't go anywhere.
We are currently in month two of Russia's assault on Ukraine. And according to the United Nations, more than five million people have fled Ukraine during this time, with some able to find safe haven in neighboring countries like Poland. But still, there are others who have chosen to stay in Ukraine and fight Russian forces while helping other civilians in harm's way. That's what 53-year-old Yulia Payevska was doing as an EMT. Ms. Payevska was in eastern Ukraine helping two orphan children escape their humanitarian corridor when Russian soldiers stopped her. Since then, her whereabouts, along with the whereabouts of those two children, are unknown. This is all according to her husband, who is still searching desperately for his wife. Russia has denied any involvement in this incident. Neither the U.S. government nor Ukrainian government have officially commented on this incident either. The worst part, though, may be that Ms. Payevska's story is likely just one of many others like it. Ms. Payevska's husband, Vadim Pusunov, joins us now. Uh, Mr. Pusunov, thank you for joining us live from Ukraine. It means a lot that you've taken time out of your schedule to speak with us. Uh, thank you so much. When was the last time that you spoke with your uh, wife? Can you tell us what happened and, and when? Yeah, uh, first of all, let me thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to share my wife's story. So the last time I had uh, any contact with her was. Uh, the day before her abduction, I guess it was uh, March uh, 14th. Uh, we had a very, very short conversation on the telephone. You know that uh, uh, it is very, um, it is very difficult to uh, get contacted with uh, someone in Mariupol right now. So it was very, very basic, very short conversation, like how do you do and what's happening and that was the, that was the last time I uh, spoke to my wife. Can you tell me what she was doing or where she was going at the time that she disappeared? Uh, all right, so uh, first I got to know about her abduction from the video post made by Oksana Karczynska where she uh, said that uh, my wife was captured by Russians somewhere around Mariupol uh, but later on, I figured out that she was uh, captured on her way from Mariupol to Zaporizhia. So there, uh, they were moving by the green corridor provided by the Russians, and they were uh, stopped at the uh, uh, Mangush, I guess that's the name of the settlement, uh, Mangush checkpoint. So they were searched and they were arrested. So uh, my wife and her driver, her driver, Sergei. Mr. Pusanov, what you're describing is terrifying. Um, our thoughts are with you. I can't even imagine what you're going through right now. Is the Ukrainian government assisting you in any way to bring your wife back? Oh, of course, of course. I reported about this uh, to our authorities. Uh, and, uh, of course, they are doing everything to uh, free my wife. But the problem is that the Russians, they first, they just denied even having her. So we couldn't get any information about her whereabouts, about her condition, about anything. And uh, the situation remains the same till this day. I mean, they're telling nothing. They uh, refused to exchange her because uh, we have uh, a special committee uh, which deals with the uh, uh, prisoner of war swap. Uh, and every time they um, they ask them to, to exchange her, they deny. I mean, it sounds like you are fighting for any scrap of information that you can get. How common Absolutely. are... How common are, are these types of disappearances in Ukraine right now? Uh, I can't tell you how often uh, people disappear like this, but uh, this case is a little bit uh, special because my wife is uh, very uh, famous. I mean, among volunteers, among medics, among patriots, she's very popular, and I think that she has some value. Or maybe she's of great value for Russian propagandists. That's why they are keeping her 
I don't know where, and probably they have some plans uh, for her. I mean, they will use her in some propagandist purposes. Mr. Vadim Pusanov, again, I want to thank you so much for your time. Um, we can only imagine what you're going through right now, and our thoughts are with you as you try to piece together the elements of this story for yourself and, and for your family, and as you try to get more information. So thank you for taking time out of what is a really difficult period uh, to share your story with us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for your support and for this opportunity to talk to you. Thank you. Coming up next, we shift to the pandemic and, you guessed it, masks. We'll bring you up to speed on the changing guidance all across the U.S. Plus, it is 420. Later on, we're going to take a closer look at pot equity. Who is making the green from the green? Stay with us. Well, as you probably noticed, the end of federal mask mandates on public transportation sent shockwaves throughout the country this week. In fact, just hours ago, the CDC responded to the mandate reversal, writing that it is CDC's continuing assessment that at this time, an order requiring masking in the indoor transportation corridor remains necessary for the public health. The Department of Justice chimed in as well, saying that in light of the CDC statement, they've decided to appeal the judge's ruling in court. We should note that that appeal will have no immediate effect on this mandate. In fact, masking will remain optional for many transportation companies. We're talking Uber, Delta, Amtrak, just to name a few. And as you can imagine, reaction to this mandate ranges from relief to fear. But it seems the most common reaction may be confusion. I feel as though it's a lot of unexplained um, things going on. It's here like one minute wear them, one minute don't wear them. So, hey, I'm keeping mine on. Confusing. Absolutely confusing and difficult to navigate in terms of what we should do, shouldn't do, options that we have and don't have. Joining us now is Dr. Kavita Patel, an NBC News medical contributor. Dr. Patel, thanks for being with us this evening. And just first off, we do have to address the fact that COVID cases are currently rising. In the last two weeks alone, cases are up more than 22 percent in the U.S. So, Dr. Patel, what is your professional take on this mandate? I mean, is now the right time? Yeah, Morgan, good to be with you. So now is the right time to keep our masks on exactly for the reason you described. Cases are going up. And while cases are going up and we have some good news, Morgan, hospitalizations and deaths are not going up. We still have to be vigilant. And keep in mind, when you're on a plane, train, bus or Uber or Lyft, you're in pretty close quarters with people. So if they're not wearing a mask, but you are, you can protect yourself. But it's better when more people around you are wearing masks. But, Doctor, I mean, if we sort of consider the other side of this, I mean, it does seem like there's always another variant that just is waiting in the wings right. for us. So if we don't remove yeah. our masks now, sort of when will we? When? I, 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 Morgan, I'm with you. And so here's kind of how I think about it, both clinically, scientifically, and just practically. Number one, I would love to have everyone get vaccinated, and that includes under five. Still don't have a vaccine for them. And keep in mind that for immunocompromised people, we know that our current vaccines are helpful, but they're not necessarily enough. We know that this is a point of vulnerability. So what do we need? When will we feel like we can take masks off? Certainly when cases are coming down. And we have, I think in the next month or so, we should have an answer for the under five vaccine along, Morgan, with treatment. We have now oral pills, IV treatments, some of these are not getting used and we need to use them, but this is the kind of kind of whole approach so that if you do get infected, which we expect people will, that we will be able to treat them really quickly. But cases going up is not the right time to take away these layered precautions. And Morgan, I'll just point out, especially in public transit, because you have to go to work and you sometimes don't have a choice kind of who you're sitting next to or how close you are to those people during rush hour. And I guess it's that choice that's creating, as we heard right. one woman say earlier right. in the show, so much confusion. So I guess another way right. to ask that question is sort of, you know, about masking as a concept. If, if masking is, in fact, optional, but everyone doesn't commit, is masking as a concept effective? Yeah, it can be effective. It's what we call one-way masking. It's definitely not as good as if everyone is at least wearing, you know, like a surgical mask or something that's high quality. But if you are all by yourself, Morgan, in a plane full of 300 people, but you have a high quality mask on, we're talking KN95, N95, 
and you're just very careful, you can minimize risk. It's not zero, but no, nothing is zero risk. So I do think that people can still safely protect themselves. But think about that anxiety. You know, it must feel very anxious if you're immunocompromised. We have about 10 million Americans that fall into that category. And we have about 20 million children that have not had access to a vaccine yet. So we have a lot of people that are still there while cases are going up. I think that's the critical point. Cases going up, not the right time. I am all for masks coming off as cases come down and everyone has equitable access to vaccines, treatments, and options. Equitable access. Dr. Kavita Patel, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. And to our viewers, stay with us because we want to dive into some of today's other top stories in just a moment, like Johnny Depp's testimony in his defamation trial against his ex-wife and Florida's governor trying to strip Disney of a special self-governing status. What this could all mean for the most magical place on earth. We'll have your questions and your answers just after the break. Don't go anywhere. Actor Johnny Depp gave another day of dramatic testimony in his $50 million defamation case against his ex-wife, Amber Heard. He told jurors that she emotionally and physically abused him during their two-year marriage. She has a need for conflict. She has a need for violence. It erupts out of nowhere. It wasn't my girl. It was, it was she had become my opponent. All right, so this lawsuit is a response to an op-ed that Heard wrote back in 2018 for the Washington Post, in which she said that she became the public figure representing domestic abuse. NBC News correspondent Steve Patterson has more, but a warning to our viewers, his report has images that some may find disturbing. Well, it is week two of the Johnny Depp defamation trial against Amber Heard and day two of Johnny Depp himself on the stand. And after a day of really establishing Depp as a character, uh, today we saw some fireworks in court because they really got down to the brass tacks of these catastrophic fights that have been alleged since before the trial even started. Depp on the stand, very somber, very slow in his method of talking, really detailing uh, several of these fights where he says it was heard, not Depp himself, who initiated the fights, who engaged in physical and mental and emotional abuse that led to the manipulation, which he claims led to this 2018 op-ed that defamed him and cost him so much of his career. That's what he got on the stand, alleging there were gruesome photos admitted into evidence showing his finger that was sliced off in one of these fights. He says Amber Heard threw a vodka bottle at him that shattered and shattered his finger as well. And that was just one instance, including being beaten and punched and slammed in the head with a door uh, that he says Heard, uh, he alleges Heard uh, uh, put out there and, and did in several of their fights. Uh, and so now it's the cross-examination. Depp still on the stand. We expect to see tomorrow. Uh, Heard's attorneys really go after him, not only on the stories that he alleged happened, but on the assertion that he was ever defamed in the first place, really focusing on the spirit of the reason why there's a trial in the first place, that in some way Heard wrote that article to destroy his reputation and destroy his career. Heard's attorneys are going to go after that first and then try to tear down his character. All in about five weeks more of this trial left to go already. We've seen so many fireworks and more to come. Back to you. Thanks so much to R.C. Patterson for that report. The most magical place on earth is once again steeped in controversy. Today, the Florida State Senate passed a bill that strips Walt Disney World of its special tax status. Now, that status has allowed the theme park to basically function as its own municipality since 1967. It's known as the Reedy Creek Improvement District, which essentially means that Disney had the right to function as its own government. It's a deal that saved the company millions of dollars a year in local taxes. But now, with Support from Florida's Governor Ron DeSantis, that could all change. Here's NBC's Kerry Sanders. Nobody could have predicted this, but in Florida today in the State House, the Senate, which is majority led Republicans, passed a bill that's going to strip Disney of its autonomy. They have their own separate government. It's called the Reedy Creek Improvement District. Uh, Disney is the largest single site employer in the state. Clearly, they've had power since the earliest of days. In fact, it was 1967, even before Disney World was built, that they got this autonomy from the government. It's a Reedy Creek Improvement District because they were improving the area. It's 40 square miles 
like the size of San Francisco. It's a big area. And as part of being their own government, they can issue municipal bonds. They're responsible for the EMS. They are building and zoning. But now the governor, who's in a fight with Disney over a completely unrelated topic, is leading a Republican effort to strip them of that authority. Now, the fight is really over the parental rights and education bill. Critics call it the don't say gay bill. At the end of the day, when Disney decided to oppose that, saying that they will fight not only in the legislature to get it repealed or also in the courts, Disney saying that they would not stop, upset the governor who said, well, tit for tat, I'm going to come at you. And so he came at them over their unique status. It's important to note, while they have this unique status, and it certainly gives them benefits, and we are in a state that has a lot of theme parks, no other theme parks have been publicly pushing for Disney to be stripped of this authority. And it's still a little early because there's no real sense of what the impact will be if the House, which... Thursday could easily vote on joining the, the Senate and stripping this autonomy that this private government, basically, that Disney has, um, and then the governor would sign it. There, there's no real sense of what the impact would be, but there are some early indications that the debt that is carried in that area by Disney right now would transfer to the residents of both Orange County and Osceola County. And by one accounting, that would be about $2,200 per person, a debt that would then go to the communities and thus to the taxpayers. All right. So as we mentioned just a moment ago, this is not the only time that Disney has been in the headlines recently. But our question to you is, has the company's standings on controversial issues really changed your personal view of the company? I mean, would it make you reconsider your next visit to its theme park, for example? We want to know what you think. So you can tell us at Now Tonight on social media or you can leave us a voicemail, 888-575-2NBC. You can even send us an email at nowtonight at NBCnews.com. From Disney now to Netflix, which had a particularly rough day. Shares tanked more than 35 percent, and the streaming company says it has lost subscribers for the first time in a decade. Here's NBC's Emily Akeda, who tells us why. For the first time in more than a decade, Netflix lost subscribers, 200,000 of them. The stunning decline, sending the media giant stock nosediving 35% today. It's a disaster for anybody who owned it at this point. A major setback for the longtime frontrunner in the streaming race. Forecast that it would lose even more subscribers going into its spring quarter, roughly 2 million subscribers. Netflix says suspending service in Russia, increasing competition, inflation, and easing pandemic restrictions are partly to blame. COVID created a lot of noise and how to read the situation, you know, boosted us a lot in 2020. Now, in an attempt to reverse the trend, changes are on the way, and they could include a crackdown on password sharing. The platform boasts 220 million subscribers, but estimates another 100 million households are watching without paying. Netflix is also waiting a lower priced option that would include ads. A change in tune from several years ago when CEO Reed Hastings posted no advertising coming onto Netflix, period. The first time it actually acknowledged that competition is really uh, cutting into its ability to grow. Netflix's loss has sent shockwaves across the streaming industry, with other media stocks also falling today. But suddenly the market has begun to reassess what the potential is for streaming. A warning experts say that streaming has limits. Emily Iketa, NBC News, New York. Sources tell NBC News that U.S. border agencies could face a budget shortfall of hundreds of millions of dollars if Title 42 ends next month as planned. Now, Title 42 is a health law that was issued by the CDC under former President Trump, and it basically cites the pandemic as a reason to turn away migrants who are attempting to enter the United States without giving them the chance to seek asylum. Well, now this rule is set to expire in about a month on May 23rd. Meanwhile, according to internal predictions, some some operations for ICE and CBP could be completely out of funds as early as July. So to cover the shortfall, the White House may ask Congress for additional funding. But internal projections within ICE and CBP predict that as many as 14,000 migrants could begin crossing the U.S.-Mexico border once Title 42 ends next month.
Weed is getting the green light across the country. So on this 420, we take a look at pot equity and what you need to know about it. That's just after the break. Don't go anywhere. All right, so today is 420, a date that's become known worldwide for celebrating all things marijuana. But in New Jersey, well, that party may just have to wait at least one more day. Beginning tomorrow, the first marijuana retail stores will open to the public in the Garden State where anyone 21 or over will be able to purchase cannabis without a medical card. New Jersey joined 17 other states in Washington, D.C. in legalizing marijuana. And just next door here, New York is working on its own retail regulations, while the state of New Mexico began sales just a few weeks ago on April 1st. So we asked how the push to legalize pot has affected you. And here's what Luke left in our inbox. The decision to legalize marijuana has affected me in the way that I can now choose if I want to buy CBD strains with no psychoactive effects, but still the benefits of increased appetite, help with sleeping, and help with anxiety. Or I can choose between the THC strains indica and sativa so anna also emailed her thoughts to us saying i've been waiting for the legalization of cannabis for years i have a genetic disorder called ehlers danlos syndrome and it comes with a lot of pain i know that cannabis is a powerful and effective pain reliever i would like to be able to help grow a new economy Another interesting element to this issue is that with more states cashing in on the cannabis industry, there's a push to prioritize people with prior marijuana convictions. In one New Jersey community, pot equity has been the focus all along. We met a young man who hopes to become one of the first in the state to turn his past into profit to do this and bring all this expertise and talent back at home, it's a dream come true for me. My name is Tahir Johnson. I'm born and raised here in Ewing Township, New Jersey, third generation. My mom grew up here, graduated from high school here. My parents actually were the first African Americans on our street in 1954. My mother, yeah, for over 30 years, she worked at General Motors. And when GM left, that really made a major impact the town really changed. Where my shop will be located is right there on the block where General Motors was, where my grandmother retired from. I've been a long-time cannabis lover, for lack of a better word. I was arrested for cannabis on three separate occasions, and the cops said that I looked like a drug dealer, and they ended up searching my car. I had a small amount of cannabis. I had a, about a dime bag of weed. I would tell my children, you know, especially when they became teenagers, to be careful driving while black. And many times they got stopped and arrested by the police. They never even told us, you know. I, so now I'm hearing that they might have gotten stopped 75 to 100 times each, just from being in a certain neighborhood or walking down the street. And for me, as somebody who's had a previous cannabis charge, I qualify for social equity. I'm also a minority-owned business in my hometown as an impact zone. Uh, my name is Bert Steinman. I am the mayor of Ewing Township. I can quite frankly, I didn't know much about uh, the cannabis business at all. I was very reluctant at first. Never smoked it in my life or tried it at all. I know a lot of people say that, but it is true. It's, it's new to everybody and it's, and it's ever evolving. They're still viewing it through that old lens of, you know, the devil's cabbage. More deadly is the menace of marijuana. When it became a referendum for the state, 73% of our, my population, the people of Ewing, really wanted it. So that, at that point, it just became a no-brainer. We were very much engaged in that conversation and trying to figure out how do we ensure that folks get a fair shot. We do want to look for individuals that kind of had a rough start in life and had to have an opportunity to turn that all around and to hear certainly fits that. That's really what this is aimed at uh, for social equity and justice. But social equity is really about um, making sure that there is a level playing field and acknowledging where in the past it hasn't been so. African Americans are four times more likely to be arrested for cannabis and we have an industry now that did 26 billion dollars in sales last year so I think this that it's important to try to create opportunities for people of color who've been the most impacted by the war on drugs. So I've actually had all of my cannabis charges expunged. Expungement is a critical important piece of legalization and giving people back their dignity. But 
it's such a tough process to navigate. Like they give you this thick packet and you know, it's kind of like figure it out. Let's fix those social issues. Let's put people back in their homes, put people back in society so they can contribute in the way they've always wanted to. So I get to take something that's been a source of pain for my family to actually be something that can be a source of profit. My mom and I actually went and took a tour of um, Columbia Cares New Jersey Cultivation Facility. I could not believe, uh, you know, what I was seeing. <laughs> Growing and manufacturing, yep, packaging, um, everything is done within these four walls right now. I have thousands and thousands of beautiful plants, you know, things that people would have been uh, <laughs> locked up for. Here we have, the facility was amazing. All right, so this is the small indoor bedroom. So in New Jersey, everything comes in from seeds. They sit in here um, until a good root structure is formed, and then they get potted into a one gallon pot. Everything then gets moved into our balloon rooms. It was just really interesting in just seeing the growth process. All the plants will live in here for about eight weeks. So now you can start getting a lot of the aromatics coming out now as the plants get a little bit older in their, in their life. So this room here is the large space of, of veg. Total square footage out here in terms of bloom is about 10,000. And then it looks like that's probably our next harvest back here. You can really see it's starting to dry down. So you can just see the difference in all the plants there. So it's a perpetual harvest. Every week you're harvesting right around 100 plants up front, and then the back's about four to 500 plants. So I started in Columbia Care September of 2019. I was uh, operations manager for an Anheuser-Busch wholesaler in Delaware for Bud the Buds, <laughs> you know? So I mean, yeah, never would have thought. I grew up in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, and 80s, and I've seen the transition of the, the drug. Just a young boy. Under the influence of the drug, he killed his entire family with an axe. I remember when it, when it first happened, when Nancy Reagan... Just say no. I never thought I would live to see this day. I saw a black president, now I'm seeing the legalization of marijuana. Congress has stood by for too long, as communities of color in particular were torn apart. H.R. 3617 doesn't just federally deschedule marijuana. It incentivized marijuana use and distribution, and it's reckless in its approach. It is long past time for the federal government to recognize that this experiment in legalization has been a resounding success. I think federal legalization has its, uh, its benefits and its challenges. There's been some good legislation at the federal level. And even the Cannabis Administration Opportunity Act that my home Senator Cory Booker has advanced, the Moore Act that just recently passed the House. The Safe Banking Act has uh, passed a number of times as well on the House side. The challenge that people have with access to capital not being able to have a bank just makes it that much more difficult. At any given time, I mean, you can have a, you know, twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollar a month electric bill. The startup cost and the cost that it that it takes to just run is just unbelievable. The last thing we want is a plantation-based uh, economy where um, you can participate, but you have to be a worker. Each state is a laboratory of democracy, where little by little we're learning from each other and the mistakes and successes that we've had there. I've been watching them in this process for the last four years. So this is like a miracle to see my son on the front for it, uh, this revolution. I'm super proud. But even being in this same very building, when I walked in, um, knowing I was doing this interview, it was touching because, again, any time where I'd been here before, it would have been downstairs where the courthouse is, and now I'm upstairs doing an interview for the same, the same thing that, you know, growing up would have been, um, you know, <laughs> very different. All right, so with us now is Ben Kovler, the founder and CEO of Green Thumb Industries, and Khadijah Triple. She's the Senior Vice President of Corporate Social Responsibility at Curaleaf. Welcome to you both. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Khadijah, I want to start with you. You know, how many others like to hear do you think are out there who should be first in line to be a part of this industry? Well, you know, I've been working on this issue for the last four to five years. And I, I know to hear personally, as a matter of fact, he uh, tried to get an internship with me at Marijuana Matters, but there are countless people out there who have this same story. Uh, and our work at Cureleaf is to identify what are the appropriate ways that our company can show up in support of people like to hear. Ben, I mean, what does bringing a state like New Jersey and, and soon here in New York sort of into this legal fold mean for the industry as a whole? Oh, it's a big step in the right direction. Um, 
with the end of prohibition on the East Coast starting, there's a real opportunity for folks like to hear and others to get into the industry. This is a real force of economic good. And it's folks like to hear and others that are out there that can get in the industry, can become new entrepreneurs. And this is how you change the cycle. We know that the war on drugs was a failure. And this is an opportunity to create new wealth in cannabis. And that's what we're doing at Green Thumb on the ground every day. Well, speaking of creating new wealth, I mean, both of your companies are, are what are known as MSOs or multi-state operators, which essentially means that you have retail, manufacturing and cultivation facilities all across the country. Khadija, what kind of social equity policies are you finding are the most successful in these cases? And, and frankly, is there anything that's not working? Is there something that's obvious that needs to be fixed? Yeah, I think there is a couple of things that I'll, I'll talk to, right? Um, one of them is I think we have to stop seeing the major stakeholders as adversarial. We have to figure out what are the ways in which government can pull its appropriate lever levers and how can the private industry, companies like Cureleaf and GTI, what is the appropriate role? We can no longer keep moving as if we are antagonistic against each other. I think right now presents a real opportunity for corporate cannabis, community cannabis, and the government regulators to figure out how do we usher in new opportunities with cannabis legalization. Uh, and I think the things that have worked are when industry leaders like Cureleaf uh, put together a, a robust social impact program that allows for social equity to show up across the ecosystem. Now, a lot of people will talk about ownership of licenses, and that is critical and is super important. But we also mm -hmm. have to figure out how does cannabis legalization and social equity specifically address the harms related to health inequities, education right. inequity, housing inequity. Like that's the real opportunity. I'm excited that we um, might have a chance to talk about this at both the state and federal levels. Ben, I want you to jump in here briefly because, I mean, you said just a moment ago that this was a step in the right direction. And there's a lot of money on the line. Let's be clear. I mean, U.S. cannabis sales reached $25 billion, with a B, dollars last year. And according to some forecasts, that number could almost triple by 2030. So, Ben, where do you see the industry as a whole sort of going? Where do you think this ultimately takes us? And what could be the benefits to our society? Yeah, I mean, we're looking at social equity in a multi-pronged approach. We, we see a lot of sponsorship and underwriting and support for nonprofits that are in the trenches working to expunge records. Like you heard about some of the struggle there. That's really difficult. We're also underwriting new entrepreneurs to get into the industry. This is federally illegal and access to capital is incredibly difficult. And finally, educational programs, direct sponsorship to educational institutes that can create new entrepreneurs. This is a brand new industry and there's tons of opportunity for growth. And to the numbers, 25 billion may sound big. But let's put it on the map for a minute. Wine, the U.S. wine industry is about 55 billion. The U.S. spirits industry mm. is about 70 billion or more. We think cannabis will be 75 to 100 billion. And that wow. means from here up, there's another $100 billion of wealth that can be created. So it's very early and it's important to bring on new entrepreneurs as we change the cycle really over a decade. Uh, because this really is the next great American growth story, and it's really important who's involved, and Cureleaf, Green Thumb, and everybody is here to make sure that that goes well. Ben, Khadija, we only have a minute left, so I, I want us to be brief here, but I cannot let you go without asking just, you know, about public perception and real, really where we are as a society in the treatment of marijuana, because the public polling is pretty clear when it comes to legalization. 66% of Americans say that recreational marijuana should be legalized on a federal level. Where do you think we are? I mean, socially, do you still think there is a taboo when it comes to smoking pot? Oh, absolutely. I'll tell you, when I went to the Kennedy School and I told my parents that I was going to, you know, use my fellowship at Harvard to talk about weed, they were like, are you insane? <laughs> so, you know, there's still stigma, but I, I, am, I am actually encouraged. The fact of the matter that we have, um, you know, aunts and uncles who are asking about CBD. So the times are changing, but we have to do more around education to reduce that stigma. Ben, the last word on that? Sure, and I'd say the country is overwhelmed with can of curiosity. I'm at the country's first on-premise cannabis consumption bar where you can order cannabis to consume here. Tomorrow it opens legalization in New Jersey. This is just the beginning. People don't sleep well, nobody likes being hung over, and there's too much anxiety in the world. We think this is a source of positivity, of wealth creation, and we're happy and honored to be a part of it.
You heard it here first, folks, on 420. Khadija, Ben, thank you so much for joining us. Ben Kovler, founder of CEO of Green Thumb Industries. Khadija Kareliev, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Meanwhile, over in Colorado, legal sales have been active back since 2014. The state reached a record $2.2 billion in cannabis sales just in the last year. NBC's Maura Barrett reports from Denver. 20 years ago, Dwayne Benjamin got caught smoking pot. Those marijuana charges from back then now are giving him and his business a lift. Who else paid? He's the founder of Tetra Lounge, a social club of sorts. It's the first of its kind, at least legally. This is in Colorado for the last 10 plus years. You've been able to purchase marijuana as a visitor, as a tourist, and there's never been a safe place or legal space for you to consume cannabis. A new Denver business license lets customers actually light up and smoke on site, sparking new opportunity in this big industry. But this license came with a catch. The social equity license gives people with opportunity that have been affected by the war on drugs and been pretty much shut out of the industry for so many years, the opportunity to build. In an effort to right the wrongs of the past, for the first five years, the city of Denver is only accepting applicants whose families have faced marijuana-related convictions or who live in low-income neighborhoods. So the house is from 1891. Chris Chiari's hotel also qualified, as he says the war on drugs affected his family. And I would say very clearly that we are putting the cart before the horse. We do need to expunge and let everyone out of prison for marijuana crimes now before we go any further towards nationalizing this industry and this market. According to the ACLU, black people are nearly four times more likely to get arrested for marijuana possession. Racial disparities in convictions like this have historically prevented minorities from getting licensed to run a legit cannabis business. Out of over 700 dispensaries in Colorado, the fact that four are owned by people of color um, is dismal. Social equity was put into place to be able to balance the idea that we have 1,667 white owners and at the time, maybe 10 black owners, maybe 15 Latino owners. Benjamin predicts he'll make at least $600,000 this year, while Chiari plans to increase his daily rate at the hotel by 40 percent, all because of this new license. This being a social equity push, you see this as a good first step? I do. I think it's not a good first step. I think it's necessary to really rectify some of the things that the war on drugs caused. Thank you so much to our colleague, Moore Barrett, for that report. And tune in next week for part two of our Pot Equity series. We'll travel to California and Massachusetts, where equity applicants have been operating for several years now. And in the meantime, we want to hear from you. So please tell us your stories about how the push for pot legalization has affected you. Email now tonight at NBCNews.com, or you can leave us a voicemail at 888-5752-NBC. Thank you so much for making time to join us. Joshua Johnson returns to the anchor chair tomorrow. You can catch me, Morgan Radford, and my co-anchor, Aaron Gilchrist, every weekday starting at 11 a.m. Eastern right here on NBC News Now. Until then, I'm Morgan Radford. Have a wonderful night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.